Hello again, everyone, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the last technical session of the day, Risk and Reliability. Our first speaker is Dr. Robin Harap, who is a professor in the Department of Geological Sciences and Geological Engineering at Queen's University. His work lies at the intersection of geology, geospatial information, and game design. His current research includes projects on rockfall simulation in game engines, games for geoscience education, and historical simulation games for public school education. Join me in welcoming Robin. Hi, everyone. Um, compared to the pretty solid engineering talks that we've been hearing, this is going to be a bit of a departure for two reasons. First of all, it's conceptually very different. And the second issue is going to be that it's, it's quite speculative. So I want to talk about the process of geological mapping. And the first thing I'm really going to concentrate on is the idea of mapping that I did when I was a, a young guy. I'm clearly not a young guy anymore. But what was involved was you'd go and, and look through libraries of existing geological maps and air photos and reports. And you'd synthesize that into a sort of a working model of what you wanted to do in the field. And then during the course of mapping, which might take several years, you would yourself synthesize a geological map and a legend, and you'd uh, write a report, and then you'd um, publish those. And the, the kind of the head figurine here represents the fact that a lot of the information that you used and a lot of the thought process never gets captured. It's, it's what we call tacit knowledge. And while the report might end up in a filing cabinet and maybe a, such a large collection of filing cabinets that there's a card catalog and various other things, the, the tacit knowledge essentially retires with the person who moves on to a different project or literally retires. So in some cases, when you're geological mapping, you, you're in a team environment or you, you call for help. And, and in that case, not only do you have your own collection of information, but you've got reports that they're contributing. And of course, they have their own mental models of what they were doing, their own tacit knowledge that never ends up in those reports. So I was pretty heavily involved in the introduction of uh, GIS and CAD and various things to geological mapping. And so I very quickly transitioned from using paper-based mapping to using CAD and was involved in things like the first um, CAD augmentation systems for geological note-taking. And then of course, as GIS got more accessible, we, we moved to things like RPU GIS. And really that's been a, a huge increase in how we approach the map making part, but really not so much the report writing part and not so much the, the, the issue of, for example, what a legend is, or for example, what do we do about this, the un, unwritten things that never end up in any of those. So in geological engineering, we make the situation significantly more complex because we add the fact that we're not just abstractly making a map, we're directly doing decision support. And perhaps that decision support is in response to a serious incident along a rail corridor, for example. And we might be needing to design and evaluate mitigation strategies. And, and one of the key things that we recognize is very often we add to the mix of geological mapping and, and observation, we add the idea that you're gonna use simulation tools to actually run scenarios. And those are yet another form of data that's being thrown into the mix of what we see in the field and what we use in the field and what comes out of the field and what goes back into things we do later in the field. So really what I'm kind of emphasizing here is all of these tools have an unspoken dimension. And I would break that into stuff that just will never end up in a report, but also all the little decisions you made along the way and, and the little observations that you made and other people made these are, are kind of lost in the traditional domain. So one of the issues with, with the, the CAD and GIS approaches is they really constrain the way you enter data. And so it's not very likely you're going to have a way to just add a free form sort of commentary on why you did what you did. And therefore, connections to the mental model you, you had in mind really can't be made. And again, though you may have used modeling tools to support some of your decisions, Connecting between, say, a map and, and those modeling tools is very weak. The other huge issue is that what we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years is that there's what's called a digital dark age. And what that means is that 20 years or 25 years later, you can't even open the files anymore. So there's a kind of a need for universal formats so that we can 
persist in using data into the, the long future, right? 40-year-old reports on paper are perfectly usable. 40-year-old computer files usually can't be opened. So I want to talk about something called convergence. And that is the idea that over time, tools integrate functionality that used to be in separate tools. Things get agglomerated. Sometimes to incre they increase the complexity of the result and sometimes they decrease it. So an example of that would be that when GPS was introduced and I incorporated it into my mapping, it was yet another thing I had to do. And then I started using Apple Newtons for mapping. So that was a PDA device that I had to incorporate into everything else I was doing. And then a cell phone so I could call somebody up, yet another device. And cloud storage, right? That became fairly recently available and you could actually keep some of your reports in the cloud for access. Well, of course, all of these things have now converged and you can do all of these things with your phone which is an example of convergence, things converging down to one tool. So in the CAD domain, convergences have been a big thing. So the original CAD systems were essentially mechanical engineering drawing tools. And we quickly used them for geological mapping and for all kinds of infrastructure mapping. And CAD is essentially absorbed back from the GIS domain, the ability to do basic GIS stuff. Lots of CAD systems can do that. But then they also absorbed 3D visualization and project management and database functionality. They essentially ate what used to be separate products. And a lot of them came from the urban and architectural domain. And so the, the bottom right screenshot is, is what's called Revit. And it's a tool that essentially not only incorporates CAD and visualization and so on. It also does things like maintenance scheduling, all built into one convergent tool. And the big thing about it from our point of view what I'm going to go forward on is that it, it incorporates models of the world that may be used in other areas as well. So I'm going to take a big jump here and I'm going to talk about game engines. So game engines, well, what are games? Games are, well, they're models of the world. You know, they're often violent, but they're models of a, of a world, often an imagined world. And they're often in 3D and they, they have to run in real time. Otherwise, players get annoyed and they make extensive use of physics and simulation to do what they do. And modern games are made using game engines, which are kind of CAD looking tools that build models of the world, often in 3D. They load assets from a diverse number of sources, including CAD. They have physics and simulation built in and they emphasize not being too hard to use so that game designers can get work done. So the elephant in the room in the game industry is that the real expense in a game is usually constructing the world, it's the art. Assets are expensive because artists need to be paid. So there's been a real convergence in recent years to actually using real world assets that were often constructed for say architecture and just adopting them into a game, right? Games are often set in enough of a real world that doing that is a win. You don't have to build something because it already exists. And they're increasingly physics simulations because it's easier to simulate an explosion than it is to animate one. This is really about cost in the game industry, but it's a really big thing to us. So this is actually um, an imaginary um, environment, somewhat like Iceland. And in this environment, what they did was they actually went to Iceland, the company Quixel, and they did ultra high resolution scans of objects and they made them available as libraries. And then they constructed a world out of those libraries. This is a game environment, it's photorealistic. It does physics simulation. So we started playing with these ideas almost 10 years ago now using the Unity game engine. And we had two theses, uh, Matt Anderson built a preliminary Rockfall simulation using the Unity game engine. And then Zach Sala did some work on increasing the ability to have fragmentation and also to do validation of the results. And essentially what we were getting at here was that we could use a game engine to do Rockfall simulation in a little model of the real world. And this is again, 10 years ago. So the latest demo of the Unreal Engine, they did Rockfall simulation as a side effect of having a character walk through a cave. They had orders of magnitude more particles than we had, and they looked dramatically better. Not that that's necessarily an end goal in what we're doing, but they had many, many more interactions. So real world simulation of things that we face in geotechnical mapping along railway corridors is something we get for free out of using a game engine. So I wanna to return to the field mapping problem, right? This problem that I said that the other issue is that while we're doing all these things, well, maybe we could use a game engine, but what about these things that never get recorded? 
This is um, a, a game that was designed by Ubisoft, a Canadian company, and it was an ancient Egypt game. And what they realized was by giving the workers on the game, historians especially, an early copy of the game and having them walk around in the game world, of course, you know, on a video game console, and mark up the world with descriptions of what needed to be fixed and why they thought so, they could actually have more productivity. They've since released this as a, a history teaching tool. Um, this idea of marking up a world with why you made decisions is, is what library scientists call paradata. And it's kind of what I was getting at with all the things that don't make it into a traditional system. Semi-structured notes <clears throat> about why you did the things you did can be vitally important for somebody else to understand the context of your work, especially in complex domains. This is from a keynote this morning from NVIDIA, one of the main graphics companies. They're talking about building worlds. They're talking about building models of the world, multiple models of the world using ultra high resolution graphics. They're doing it partly for gaming, but they're doing it also to reach out to companies as companies realize that game engines can be used for all of the things that they do with CAD and with 3D visualization packages. And the neat thing about this technology is it's based on a universal scene description format. The idea there is that 30 years from now, we'll still be able to read the assets. And different people can be working on the same data with different tools at the same time. There's a universal sort of under layer that operates. This is behind an idea called a digital twin, which again comes from mechanical engineering. But the idea is you have a world model, which might be parts or it might be a railway corridor, and you might have live link sensors pouring data into that. And you can visualize it, you can interact with it, you can add to it, you can annotate it, you can run simulations. So we're starting to play with these ideas. So will convergence of these tools, will tools like that help with my geological mapping problem? Is gathering geological data, geotechnical data, building models, doing simulations and so on, is that something going to be augmented by an environment like this, perhaps with some virtual reality or augmented reality? Can we call somebody while we or they are in a virtual reality and have a discussion about a current problem? Well, I'd, I'd like to say that there's three pieces of technology that are current that might address that. The first is the deployment of 5G networks, which means that vastly more network connectivity is available. Secondly, you can now essentially dial up a supercomputer on the network. You can have, from a tablet, you can have ultra high performance computing available. You can also screen st a stream ultra high resolution graphics to the tablet from a GPU computer on the internet. So in other words, we can be standing with a tablet, using the phone on the tablet to talk to an expert, using a headset or augmented reality to visualize an outcrop and running supercomputer simulations from that tablet from the middle of nowhere once 5G is deployed. This might be where we're at in 10 years. And that's kind of where I'm getting at with this talk is that where are we gonna be at in 10 years? So as we work on geological engineering problems, as we think about this, we have to think about where technology is gonna take us in the future. And I, I hope I've raised some, some ideas about how I think things might evolve based on, for example, a keynote that was given this morning. Thank you very much for your attention. I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, that's a very interesting topic and uh, kind of a little bit of a mind expander of uh, a thing to talk about for sure. Uh, if there are any questions, we have a, a couple minutes here if someone would like to ask one. Um, I'll start us off since there's nothing yet, but uh, I'm curious. So I think it's really easy to see how this technology could be utilized as a, a great back analysis tool for many things, especially across a railway network. And I can see how uh, talking about having the 5G network up and having real time data where you can have someone maybe like a junior person in the field and you could relay information in real time back to a senior person who could help more actively look at a, a problem in real time. I agree. How, how do you see this actually coming to effect as a, a predictive technology into, into the future? Like how could we, let's say, try and prevent uh, landslides or rock slides or things like this in the future using this technology? So my co-author, Gene Hutchinson at Queens, has been heavily involved in using LiDAR and photogrammetry to do change detection. And the idea there is you, you learn on a slope what are the parts that are changing and, and under what conditions, say, weather conditions are changing. 
and that's not really my expertise, so I'm, I'm, I'll run with it a bit. But one of the things we did with the Unity um, simulation tool was we had the ability to, to look at a piece of the slope and add a virtual fence and then run rockfall simulations and see how many of the rocks would be caught by that fence, right? So you can do that. If you can do that in the field, then you could imagine saying, okay, do I know of a, enough about this slope to design a fence right now? And is anything I'm seeing around me like rubble um, you know, does it contradict that that indicates I need to do some more data collection? And one thing we've thought about that this is very speculative is, is thought about the fact that those predictive models about what's happening up a slope are heavily based on what data you have. So um, using um, automated planning methods, you could imagine that after you're on a simulation, you could say, well, the simulation is really inaccurate because a piece of the world model isn't very good. You could literally send a drone to augment the data. And so People are starting to do with that in the digital twin world. They're, they're updating models with, with live um, data from drones. Uh, you know, I think the geological engineering domain is, is really difficult because there are so many um, causal factors at play. I would be very wary of using the word prediction and, and yeah. being very confident of it. But I certainly think that, that being able to make decisions and being able to augment your data based on using, using simulations in the field means you might not end up going back to the field so often because you'd make the right decision at the time. Interesting. Yeah, there's one more question here from uh, Mer Zhang. Uh, have you built any digital twins using these gaming technologies of any of the rail networks? Yeah, so we built um, sections along the corridor you're seeing in the photo right now. Um, and we've used that with the, the, the tool. Um, we didn't focus, as I showed in the, in the Rockfall demo, we didn't focus on photorealism so far. And one thing we've not explored yet is, is integrating live sensors. Uh, but although I think that's kind of a no-brainer that you would add uh, sensor data integration. One of the issues you get into with these things is, you know, I'm a geological engineer with, with a bit of a background in computer science, but we really need to draw computer scientists more into, into our projects because the infrastructure, the technology you need to do digital twins at that scale is not a problem for a geologist. It's a problem for a team that incorporates geologists, but also um, computer scientists. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Sarab, and uh, we'll move on to our next presentation now.